It is one of the darkest chapters in Cleveland history. Tom was uh, in, in fear. And during that time, a serial killer stalked this city. When the serial killers are out, they were all afraid. A brutal killer who inspired dozens of books and blogs. He always took the head off. The Torso murderer claimed at least a dozen victims from 1934 to 1938. Sometimes he dissected them more than that. Most of the killings concentrated in an area called Kingsbury Run. These days, it's better known as the area near the flats. Uh, he was non-discriminatory, killed black, white, women, men. Interestingly, he tended to leave the men intact. But the women he cut up in smaller pieces. Don't know why. The coroner at the time said that the murderer probably could do a better job than half of his staff in dismembering a corpse. Out of the 12 official victims, only two were ever truly identified. But all of the victims had one thing in common. People who would not be missed, people who had no identity. In the pages of Cleveland's history, this was the city's first serial killer. The duel, if you will, between the Torso Killer and Elliot Ness was just a fascinating bit of history. It even brought the famed cop Elliot Ness to Cleveland to take over as public safety director. Ness, best known for taking down gangster Al Capone. But the Torso Killer wouldn't be as easy to catch. The pressure to find someone, anyone, was so intense. For years, the killer taunted Ness, sending letters and postcards. He even admitted it to Elliot Ness in one of the postcards, sort of. This one, signed the American Sweeney. Some believe it's a reference to Sweeney Todd, a fictional serial killer in Britain. So the fact that he would call himself the American Sweeney is the kind of joke he would love to play. And the true nature of the torso killer's crimes, a mystery within a mystery. The official police file disappeared. It's gone. No one can say exactly when or how it happened, but it's gone. It's why so much of today's knowledge about it is reconstructed from documents and newspapers, from people's memories. There's no sense of closure, not for the families of the victims, but not for the public, because we'll just never know. But even though investigators could never claim to have caught the killer, Dr. Badal says his years of research brought him to a single conclusion. Who do I think did it? It was Dr. Francis Edward Sweeney, uh, a skilled surgeon who fell into alcoholism and drug addiction, uh, lapsed into paranoid schizophrenia. A city gripped in fear, a dozen faceless victims. I'm 99% sure we pegged him and the belief that this face, this man, is Cleveland's torso killer. Francis Edward Sweeney, nothing points away from him. All right, folks, there's still a number you can call, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Police Crime Stoppers, 216-252-7463, 216-252-7463. Any information could be Cast down information, any little bit, can help in this case. Let's bring in our special guest joining us from Cleveland, Ohio, the detective from the Torso Case of Murders, John Francis. Franson. Also joining us is the author of In the Wake of the Butcher, Cleveland's Torso Murders, Dr. James Bedal. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both uh, for joining me tonight. Uh, John, let me start with you as a re retired detective who worked on this case. What happened to the police file? Uh, you know, it was called to my attention and uh, it started, uh, started me looking into this case based on some information we had from uh, a retired, as I recall, a retired Los Angeles uh, district attorney who was going to write a book trying to connect uh, torso murders with the uh, crime out there titled The Black Dahlia. Uh, and uh, the chief's office requested that uh, I take a look at it, get a hold of the gentleman and talk to him, see what he wanted. So I started on it, and uh, it brought me to a couple uh, publications, one by uh, Stephen Nichols, I believe. He came in, he started writing a book on uh, Elliot Ness, uh, his tenure in the Cleveland, uh, Ohio, as safety director. <clears throat> 
And during that uh, investigation, he conducted, he stumbled, he, well, he came upon the uh, torso murders, which occurred uh, during Ness's tenure. Uh, there was a detective, Peter Mirillo, I believe the name was, who originally, I guess, had been assigned to the case back in those days. And uh, one of the things I tried to find were the uh, reports and everything else that were made by the detectives back then. Um, in the time period between that and the current time of the late 90s or the early 90s when I was looking into this, the archives of the Cleveland Police Department had been moved around so many times and everything else because of moves from building to building and you know, over the years, I wasn't able to find any of the reports. So a lot of the work that I did had to do with uh, researching archival stuff pertaining to uh, Sweeney's residences and everything else. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, trying to connect him to different, uh, some of the victims or the areas where the victims were found. Uh, the first victim found was a uh, gentleman. Uh, the body was found, the parts were found down in Kingsbury Run, uh, not far from a hospital where Sweeney was known to have worked at one time or in that area. Uh, it's, a, it's a short walk from where he was uh, located in the office to where the body was found. And uh, right now I don't recall the name of that victim. But it's, it seems to me he, at one time, the victim worked at City Hospital on the city's west side. And I tried to connect part of the part of the investigation I was doing was trying to connect Sweeney with that hospital that possibly that's where he had met this gentleman. Because Sweeney, the suspect uh, that was uh, Elliot Ness's suspect, uh, had worked. Uh, trying to see if he worked at that hospital, trying to establish some type of connection. Yeah, that, 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 would, make, that would make some sense. Uh, Dr. James Bedal also with us. Um, you say everything points towards Sweeney. That seems to be the one everyone thinks. What, what, what tells you that, it, that it's Sweeney, Dr. Sweeney? Well, I'm 99% sure that Dr. Sweeney is the killer. Unfortunately, I can't take sole responsibility for pigeonholing him. Uh, I would say his name began floating around in the fringes of the Kingsbury Run murders, maybe sometime in the 70s, uh, where his name really became prominent is that, and again, I'm not sure of the date, but Elliot Ness's daughter-in-law donated all his papers to the Cleveland Historical, Western Reserve Historical Society. And among those papers were five postcards, uh, which came from the VA hospital in Dayton. Uh, one of them was signed F.E. Sweeney, paranoidal nemesis. Uh, the one that I think is most important was Good Cheer, the American Sweeney. I would say an obvious reference to the British mass murderer Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Uh, there are a number of things which point to him, and I should add at this point, nothing points away from him. Uh, the best evidence we have is David Cowles, who was one of Ness's associates, and he was head of what we would call today CSI, gave an interview to the director of the Cleveland Police Historical Society, Museum. And I'm a little vague on the year at this point, but he said we did have a suspect, and he said I won't name any names, but the details he gave of who that suspect was were so compelling it couldn't have been anyone else. And this is one of the great cloak and dagger stories of all time. Uh, they got a lead on Dr. Sweeney, and again, I can't tell you exactly when. But they rounded him up off the street. When I say they, I mean Elliot Ness and his associates. They took him to the old Cleveland Hotel, which is now the Renaissance. 
And apparently Ness had a room set aside, probably down some lonely deserted corridors precisely for this. They brought in Leonard Keeler in secret from Chicago. Leonard Keeler is the man who had invented the modern-day polygraph. They brought him into Cleveland in total secret. Uh, he administered the test, then turned to Nest and said, that's your man. I might as well throw my machine out the window if I say anything different. Now, when I wrote the first edition of In the Wake of the Butcher, which is in 2001, there were three questions I thought had to be answered. First of all, did that secret interrogation really take place? And yes, it did. David Cowles said so. Could that man be identified? Yes. That man was Dr. Francis Edward Sweeney. At that point, I couldn't say with any certainty that he had done it. In the new edition, or the more recent edition, of In the Wake of the Butcher, I, prevent, I present evidence which I feel makes it abundantly clear that, yes, he was the murderer. It's an incredibly fascinating story. Uh, and both of you gentlemen, uh, generous with your time tonight. We, we appreciate you uh, joining us to give us more insight into this one. Uh, thanks so much again, again uh, John Franson and Dr. James Bedal uh, in the wake of the butcher. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great read, both volumes you, you want to get. Uh, thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Wow. Unbelievable. Elliot Ness. All right, when we come back, speaking of great crime fighters, crime time is next. <laughs>